In July this year, she will be 93 years old. She enjoyed a career as both pianist and soprano for over four decades and is a legend in her time. She had this wonderful quality, which I think is necessary for every good artist. A natural humility, a modesty, and at the same time, this ability to really devote herself to what she was doing. She created opportunities if there weren't any. Even if you sing Bar Bar Black Sheep, it must be sung in such a way that the audience will give you an encore. I learned a great sense of style. She was always a wonderful lady in her whole personality, a whole approach to human relationships. Those lessons in her beautiful home up in Grotto Road will always remain in my memory. We set foot on South African soil, in other words, in Cape Town. My father was at the docks to meet us, and you must remember that my mother, or my sister, or myself, knew not a word of English. And he took us in a little cab to a little cottage he had prepared for us in Claremont. On the way, uh, driving along Dock Road um, from the boat, uh, my mother spied a colored man sitting on the pavement eating, I suppose, crayfish, they call them. Now, you must remember that in Italy, the lobster or crayfish was a very, very expensive item. And she'd never seen this. Um, We'd never, she'd never eaten one. She'd never, didn't even know the taste of one because it was very, very a luxury, in fact. And when she saw this colored man eating it on the pavement, she called to my father, I don't fall, I don't fall. Look at that, look at that. And so my father laughed. He said, oh, he said, they're just a penny each. And uh, then we went on and we lived in this little cottage in Claremont because uh, my father's job was nearby. There it was that I went to school at the convent in Rondebosch, played in the bioscope in Claremont. I, thought, I think it was called the Pavilion, and uh, lived my life there until I was about 18. And then um, we again we moved. My father took on several um, jobs. He worked first for Pierce's. He was an artist. But in Italy, he couldn't study art because his parents couldn't afford it. So he knew about designing, and he opened a studio in Claremont. That was during the war, First World War, of course. And uh, there he worked on Saturdays and Sundays. And during the week, he worked for Pierce's, a store nearby. There I stayed until we went to, until my father bought a house in Edale, up near Newlands Road. Um, and then eventually we bought a house in connection with them. Uh, uh, Edale, by the way, was where I got married uh, to Alberto Bergamasco. 1935, my husband bought this property, La Grotta. Um, there, uh, from that, Time, we lived here at La Grotta. 
and lived there, for, lived here or there, for 45 years. I remained in La Grotta after my husband's death uh, for some good few years until it became obvious that it, it was obvious that I couldn't stay here alone. Uh, things were getting dangerous, you know, it was not good for a woman of my age to, to remain. And uh, with the help of my son, I managed to get a flat where I stayed for about year, eight years uh, in, in, in Rondemarsh. And the university bought uh, La Grotta, my old home, where I st my family and I stayed for 45 years. Then I stayed until um, 85, 1985. Um, I had an accident then, I had to be hospitalized. Uh, then eventually, in uh, 1986, I think I went overseas. My family were urging me to go and live with them, one of them, one, one son. I went, I thought, well, I'll go and try <laughs> and see how I like it. He had bought a property in Tuscany, and I stayed there for a year. Um, but the contact with a lot of my old colleagues and friends was missing. It was lovely being with my family, but it, it wasn't altogether so satisfying as far as I was concerned. Then I came back, <laughs> and I thought, this is where I went. So then I went back again. I applied from Tuscany to Cape Town, and that was when my son said, you know, mother, you're a crazy old woman. Eventually, I decided that um, to make friends or form any kind of contacts. We used to go, uh, while I was in Italy, to the Comunale, which is the um, big theater and opera house in Florence. But we lived about 50 minutes drive, or by train or by car, from Florence. It wasn't easy to get there. I missed the concerts and uh, the cultural life generally. So I decided eventually that as much as I was grateful for my family, I had a flat of my own. I was quite independent in Italy. Um, this is where I belonged, and I came back for the last time, and here I am. to know something about my very early days when I played in the, you call it cinema now, but we used to call it bioscope. I was still at school and I was 12 years old. There was a little bioscope near us in Claremont and they wanted a pianist. They knew I could play and um, the, the, the owner was a Mr. Hoffman. And so I was engaged to play at the, um, for the pictures, at three golden sovereigns a month. How much was that? I can't tell you the exchange, what it was, but that was quite a lot of money. And I used to play uh, every day, and Saturdays, of course, a matinee, and uh, at night. And of course, in those days, there were a lot of these, what they call cowboy, cowboy pictures, and um, uh, as the, um, the matinee especially, as the uh, excitement grew, they'd tie someone on the rails, you know, and the train was coming on. And uh, the children at the matinee used to scream. And of course, it was not any of my use playing, because you couldn't hear the little piano down in the pit. They had a little pit. So um, I used to just, uh, or rather, tremolo, you know, a lot of tremolo, or else I used to just look and play. 
I started my early music training at the convent, St. Mary's Convent in Cape Town. And of course, they were all Dominican nuns. Later on, as I um, progressed, some friends of my family said that I should go to someone a little bit more. It could give me more advanced training. And I went, someone recommended Madame Nye Darrell, to whom I went. And I took all my uh, training uh, from her exams, etc. My first uh, professional debut was here in the City Hall, and I played the Liszt Rhapsody under the baton of Leslie Heward. And that was in 1926. Right? I enjoyed playing with quite a number of conductors, Braithwaite, uh, George Groves, several others, Derevitsky, and of course the, the local ones, uh, oh, El, Albert Coates also, the piano. I played in 1927, it was Beethoven's anniversary, I think, and I played the, um, the uh, Sonata, and that was in the Banqueting Hall in Cape Town. And then uh, there was the um, time when the um, royal family came out. That, I think, was quite a... And there they sat in that uh, box, and I was one of the artists. Of course, I wasn't the only one. And there I sang. Um, that was a highlight. I think it was a real honor, as far as I'm concerned, to have been chosen to play. Um, I played, I, I sang, rather, uh, the um, Alleluia of Masnets and um, De Vieni of Mozart that night. It was a very long concert, and I was very amazed at the, the um, queen who sat in that box straight as a die. She never moved, and that concert, I'm sure, was from about eight to nearly 11. It must have taken, I think, about three hours. She never moved. Her back was straight. She never leaned back. She was amazing. I wished for her sake that we'd all end up, but of course I had nothing to do with that. I was the first to play the Brahms uh, concerto in, in, this, in this country, not only in the peninsula, because they had never had in one play. In fact, they had to get the score, I believe, from London. That was, I think, um, Pickerel, I'm not quite sure. Um, so I was the first to play that particular concerto. And then the Illuminations, but that was uh, uh, by Benjamin Britten. That was the first one, the first time I sang that, was uh, a broadcast. Then uh, afterwards, I sang it in Johannesburg. I sang it in several centers. Um, those two uh, were, for me, highlights, yes. Well, I did play in this hall numerous times. I couldn't really tell you how many times, but it wasn't only. I played in, uh, with the orchestras of, of Johannesburg. It wasn't Pretoria then, it was in Johannesburg. And um, in uh, Durban, I played under Dunn uh, in those days quite a number of times. The Chopin concerto I played with him, and I can't remember several times. Um, those were mostly all because they're the ones that had the orchestras, you see. And of course, in the Johannesburg um, Broadcasting Studio, I acted, I can't remember whether I, um, under Cree, and of course, quite a lot of the operas were performed up there, you see. Of course, Paganelli was an operatic singer of fame. He and Gigli and Peter Skipper were great friends. And they were the leading Italian tenors in Italy at that period. But when the war came, that was the First World War, when Italy was allied with Britain, Peggy joined up. The other two paid big sums of money, and of course, that was another story. Peggy joined up and was in the army, where he was, I think, for two or three years. He was recalled to Paris to sing with Battistini, the Barbara Seville. And this put the whole of the diplomatic service into movement to get him from the front, in uniform, to Paris. It was a great success and, of course, wonderful newspaper critics about it. 
Well, the years passed, and of course it did affect the operatic seasons. And it was more difficult for operatic singers to get contracts. So he joined the Sistine Soloists, he a Sistine Choir, not in the chapel. That this choir was 300 of those boys and men. But they always engaged operatic soloists to take the, to go with them to Australia. Three years this happened, and the third time after the performance, they decided that they would go to South Africa, but not the choir. The choir went back to the Sistine Chapel to Italy, and the soloists came and landed here in February 1926. So that was the beginning of Peggy's career in South Africa, and he loved Cape Town. He fell in love with Cape Town at once. Now, you must remember that Paganelli had been induced by Professor Bell, who was then at the College of Music in Rosebank, to remain and form uh, an operatic school at the, at the College of Music, which had no such chair, if you like to call it. And um, Paganelli thought about this. In, so instead of going back home to Italy, he remained here. And when I started my lessons, I went to Paganelli. When Paganelli had decided to settle in Cape Town, where he thought opera should be presented, he said, this is virgin soil for opera. And he held auditions at the College of Music. And Albina came with her sister Margarita, who was a violinist of some fame. He heard Margarita sing and said, yes, yes, he'd like to teach her very much. But he turned to Albina and said, I want to hear you sing. And I said, no, no, Paganelli, I don't sing. I'm the pianist of the family. I don't want to be a singer. I don't like singers. No, 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 she said, come along. He said, nevertheless, I want to hear you. So he sang a little exercise for her, and she copied him. And he sang a little bit of Caro Mio Ben, the famous little Italian aria, and she copied him. And he didn't say anything I like it, or it's small, or anything. He just said, tell your husband I'd like to see him. That's all. So, of course, Albina told Mr. Bergamasco, and he was very excited about it and went to interview Paganelli. And Peggy said, in three years' time from now, I shall produce my first opera, and she will be my first prima donna. I've done, the, apart from the Barber, Don Pasquale, uh, Rigoletto, Traviata, um, The Magic Flute. Uh, oh, oh, I can't remember anymore. Um, quite a number of them. Uh, You've done all the Rosa. Yes, I've done all the big ones. Uh, at least those suitable to my voice, because with operatic singers, I couldn't have done, shall we say, <laughs> Wagner or something like that. That wasn't in my... Um, and Don Giovanni, yes, uh, all those Mozart ones certainly, uh, Figaro in Don in um, Mozart's Figaro, and I took all the leading roles, of course, Marina, Rosina, um, uh, Gilda, um, all those in the parts. Yes, I was going. This is during the war. I was going to Johannesburg um, to do the opera. The Barber of Seville. Now, I don't know whether you are familiar with the story. And on the train, uh, they always used to have the steward come round in the morning or on the door uh, to, to give coffee or tea, whatever, six or some unearthly hour. Now, I didn't want 
anything in the early morning. And there's always a, a ticket at the back of the compartment door saying, do not disturb. So when I went to sleep that night, I got this little ticket and I put it on the outside of the compartment so that when the steward came the next morning, he would see this and not worry me about tea or coffee. Then when we arrived in Johannesburg, uh, I picked up all my belongings, packed my things, and uh, that was that. Uh, everything I could find, hankies, my underclothes, everything. And then we got to Johannesburg, and the night we opened, uh, by the way, the, the, the um, barber was Red Viz Llewellyn from London, but that's another story. Um, in those days, there were no one to look after your props or get this ready or get or call boys. We did everything ourselves. So when the time came for Rosina, with, who had to have a letter um, um, for a prop and everything, I got all my little props on the table and got ready to go onto the stage. And in this scene, Rosina was supposed to climb the stairs and go onto a tiny little balcony. When I I put these little letters and things in my um, bosom, in my little costume, and went, climbed the stairs and got onto the balcony. And I was, uh, uh, they were, Figaro was supposed to be um, serenading me for the tenor below. So when the time came, I took this little letter, which was supposed to be a letter of love, and dropped it over the balcony. Rivers ran. Or Figaro ran to pick it up, went to the front of the stage, opened it, and read, Do not disturb. And of course, he was so flabbergasted, he didn't know what had happened. What was, <laughs> so he, for a moment, forgot what he, what he had to say or to sing, rather. <laughs> There's a recording, um, I was then in my teens, I think. Uh, they had um, an amateur, I call him an amateur, um, an amateur uh, radio. radio man who had a house in, in, uh, in, in observatory, a uh, Mr. Streeter. And occasionally he would uh, form uh, groups of people who performed, and they were not all professional. I wasn't yet a professional by any means. I was, and uh, we all used to go there and perform so that he could, um, he could um, work on all his, he had a whole room with gadgets and buttons and uh, all these uh, rails that he had in his room. Anyway, I, I was one of a group and we all went there one day. It was a singer, I was the pianist, I hadn't started singing. Um, I think there was a drama student, um, I can't remember, there were three or four of us. When I got there, I had prepared the um, Hungarian Rhapsody. Now, there's quite a showy piece with plenty of uh, um, piano and chords and things and needs a good instrument. When I got there, he had a little upright piano. This piano was swathed in blankets. The pedals were tied down. So when I got there, I said, I certainly can't play on this. You hear nothing, you hear just a muffled sound. He said, well, you can't because of the resonance and uh, lots of other technical terms he used. And um, I played. What the sounds were like, I have not any idea. But the very first one I really made was Mrs. Ellie Marks. And there used to be a, a radio man who used to do professionally and often come to the city hall when there were artists. And then if the records were good, he would sell them. Now, Mrs. Ellie Marks knew this man. She said, you're coming up to me, with me, to this man who lived uh, in a ranch somewhere. And she played for me. Uh, I think I did the Don Pasquale aria, you know? I don't know if you remember it, John. And um, that was the first, uh, let me tell you that I wasn't, uh, I paid eventually for the record. But the rest, uh, there, were, there were no recordings as such. The, the Rigoletto ones, which was made by his, mas his master's voice, were all made in Italy. 
uh, but not here. There was no official, except that um, the South African, I forget what they were called in those, the South African Broadcasting Corporation, uh, took one of Farrell, Mr. Farrell and me, doing a duet from Figaro, La Cidarem La Mano, which we did at the studio. Um, he, we had often done it before. Um, and we were quite happy with it. But we didn't know at the time that the broadcasting people were making a record of it. And they didn't tell us anything about it. One day, Farrell phoned me and said, did you hear our duet on, on the air? So I said, no. He said, well, they've been broadcasting our duet, and we have not been paid for it. He was very, very upset about that. I think, as so many artists feel the same, that when you are doing, uh, if I was playing a concerto, I enjoyed it and uh, liked it very much, I mean. And if I was singing, equally. It, there was really no preference, uh, really, you know. With the piano, I think, I, as far as I was concerned, I had to w uh, work very many more hours. It needed many more hours of practicing to do a concerto or to do a recital. But nevertheless, I enjoyed it when I did it. I retired in the late 60s, um, but I went on and I retired also from operatic. And I did a lot of broadcasting um, in the Capra area and so on, earlier than that probably. Um, all forms. And I did also a lot of oratorio, the creation, the Messiah. Uh, Judas Maccabeus, the Elijah, the Elijah, yes. And I was often asked, I went to Port Elizabeth to enact these. It was a busy life and I enjoyed it very much. I formed this Florence Chamber Opera Group and we used to have rehearsals in the drawing room, which is this one, with the students. I thought it was a very good um, opening for students who had no um, opportunity they, I, I used to have students' concerts, of course, at that time, but um, they didn't have much experience of the acting, acting the scenes, acting the, the ensembles. And so I formed this Florence Chamber Opera Group. And from there, this grew. Uh, and we, I think we were often asked to perform these little uh, chamber operas, like Cimarosa, um, Così Fan Tutti, all of them, and many condensed bigger operas which I translated from the Italian into English, especially if there was the recitative. And um, I think we performed, uh, like Menotti's Amal and the Night Visitors, that is a one-act opera, so of course it was very suitable. And we did a lot of this and gave these young people an experience of not only uh, singing an operatic aria on the stage platform, but to enact the scenes and to become acquainted with the stories and of the, uh, the operas they were enacting. I think there was not one school in the peninsula, for example, that we didn't do Amal and the Night Visitors, for example, by Menotti. I did teach at the college both piano and, um, piano and singing, and, but I taught here as well, privately, when I retired. You asked me what is the secret of my long life, I find that very difficult to, to answer. Um, my parents come from a long line of um, long living uh, parents themselves. My mother died at 95, my father 85, and I believe my grandparents the same. Uh, as far as myself, I had a very happy childhood. I, uh, a very happy married life, 50 years of very happy married life. And uh, I worked, I worked from when I was 12, because I was teaching when I was 12, as well as playing in this famous bioscope. I always did something, kept myself busy. I didn't do any special exercise, excepting not heavy exercise. I walked to school every morning from Claremont to, to run the bottom back. And uh, I used to take it all in my slide. I, I'm a small uh, eater and... Uh, enjoy my food, but no, nothing, I don't smoke, I wouldn't know how to hold a, a cigarette. But then did neither of my parents or anyone in our family smoke, so I suppose that, and I never felt that I need experiment with any, it never entered my mind. 
I think all those things had quite a lot to do with it. And my general metabolism, I think, which invariably tells us how long we, we, we live or we don't live. And here's Jenny Hobbs with her selection of best reads. She'll also be talking to authoress Barbara Trapedo. Hello. Welcome to the first collage book program for 1991. We have an interesting pile of novels for you today and an interview with a South African author who's now living in London and who made a big splash with her first book a few years ago, Barbara Trapedo. I've been a fan of John McCarey's since The Spy Who Came In From The Cold and always fall on his books with relish. I enjoy his spare, controlled writing, his enigmatic spies, and the way he peels back layer after layer of intrigue like an onion. And of course, he's a master storyteller. Hot Off the Press is The Secret Pilgrim, published by Hodder and Stoughton, a series of interludes from the life of a spy called Ned.